You live at home, surrounded by hundreds of your siblings. Leaving for work each morning, you spend up to 12 hours a day laboring outside to feed your family. Your hundreds of brothers leave home each day to congregate in the neighborhood, hoping to find a mate. An easier life, perhaps, but come the end of summer, they will all be expelled from their home. Useless mouths to feed over a cold winter. Your mother is the head of the household, but she spends the majority of her time eating and producing children. She leaves the upbringing of those children to other family members. Now, though, she's getting older and having less and less children. Your siblings sense a change, and they begin raising a few very special sisters. Soon, this handful of new sisters will fight to the death to take her place. The winner will then approach their aging mother and stab her to death. This life might seem strange to us, but it's the family life of the honeybee. When we hear the word family, we tend to imagine something that looks quite different from the social structure of most other species. Animals care for their young in many different ways, but for most species, once the offspring are old enough to fend for themselves, they're no longer supported by other members of their group. Humans, on the other hand, feel responsibility throughout their lives towards the people with whom they've formed close social relationships. Indeed, one place where we really are different from any other living species is our families. For humans, a family is a group of people who are bonded to one another by blood or by choice. People can have many different kinds of families, but one common feature across cultures is the longevity of the family bond. We know from archaeological evidence that the human family unit as we think of it has existed since prehistory, which suggests that it's a feature of our evolutionary past. If we've evolved to share close bonds with biological or chosen family members, it's likely something that, at some point in our history, helped us thrive. And so why do humans need lifelong family ties? What's the point of them? And how far back in our evolutionary past can we find them? The entire history of humankind covers almost the entire globe. From frozen Siberia to tropical Indonesia, humanity has spread everywhere, and there would be no way we could represent this without story blocks. Gathering footage for videos can be time-consuming and sometimes even risky. Drop your drone in the sea? Should have used story blocks. Wasted time on getting footage that was eventually binned? Should have used story blocks. Story blocks curated stock library has everything you need to create high-quality video in one place. With over a million 4K slash HD footage, templates, music, sound effects, images, and more, for one unlimited, predictable subscription cost. Anything you download with Storyblocks is 100% royalty free and will stay protected in perpetuity by the highest level of legal coverage in the industry. You can even enhance your social media videos by accessing exclusive Storyblocks label music tracks directly in TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And they have the best motion library on the market, refreshed frequently. And you can save time by accessing Storyblocks entire stock library in Premiere Pro and After Effects by using the Storyblocks plugin for Adobe Creative Cloud. So to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head over to storyblocks.com forward slash humankind or click the link in the description. Living with your relatives can be tricky Hyena families can have around 100 members and follow a complicated social system similar to medieval courts or the cast members on reality TV shows. It's all about jockeying for position and status. A hyena clan is led by an alpha female. Daughters form a close bond with their mothers and sisters and rank is passed down through the female line. Females, especially low-ranking ones, will sometimes leave their birth clan to strike out on their own and form a new clan in different territory. Males, on the other hand, are ranked lower, and when a male hyena joins a new clan, he's automatically booted to the lowest social ranking in the group, no matter his status in his original family. And life is no easier for the young. When baby hyenas are born, they can open their eyes right away, which is unusual for carnivores. 
One reason for this is that they spend their first few days on Earth fighting their siblings to establish who is dominant. The social rank that a baby hyena achieves in its first weeks of living will influence how privileged and successful it will be as an adult. And these sibling battles are not friendly tussles. Baby hyenas are also born with full sets of teeth and strong muscles. Giving birth to same-sex twins often results in one twin immediately killing the other. Luckily though, for many species, babies' lives are slightly less merciless. Indeed, if you were a baby alligator, just hatched on the riverbank, you'd only be 6 to 8 inches long and very vulnerable to local predators like bobcats, raccoons and other alligators. To protect you, your mother gently carries you to the water in her mouth and stays with you as you grow. And after about two years, you'd be able to swim off to find your own territory, thanks to mom's diligent care. And if you were a baby seahorse, not only would your dad have carried you as an egg in a special pouch in his tail, he'd also guard you from predators and from being swept away in the tides. Every animal species reproduces and cares for its young differently. In lots of cases, this care takes the form of something we might call a family. This might be for protection, to make sure vulnerable young animals are safe from predators. It might be so that babies can be fed together in a group, like with baby birds, or nursed from their mother until they are weaned. There's even evidence that some animal species stay in family groups because they need social bonds to thrive. However, in mammals in particular, one of the biggest reasons for staying together as a family is so that the young can learn the skills they need to find food and survive. And it's not always the parents who teach their young. If there are multiple adult family members, they can share the time and effort of passing down skills. Animal siblings often play with each other in a way that mimics adult behavior. Lion cubs tackle and wrestle one another, something that they might do to protect their territory as adults. Baby gorillas will sometimes beat their chests in a playful version of the intimidating challenge of an adult male. And so as young animals grow up in a family group, they are being taught where and how to find food, how to communicate with other members of their species, or where the family's territory is. If you were a baby meerkat, you'd grow up with siblings among a pack of up to 30, headed by an alpha female, your mother and her mate. Your mother would probably be the only female in the group having babies. The job of all the other adults in the group is to care for the children. And meerkat pups are cared for by extended family members, who also actively teach the young to hunt. Adults teach their pups how to eat a venomous scorpion by removing the stinger and showing the pups how to hunt and kill it. Once the young meerkats are able to do this, they're brought along to hunt the real thing. We can dive deep into the ocean to find familiar mammalian family ties too. Several types of cetaceans, whales and dolphins live in close-knit groups called pods that often include grandmothers. Indeed, cetaceans are some of the only species on Earth in which females live past the age where they can have offspring. These older females play a key role in helping the next generation to survive. Just like human grandmothers might spoil their grandchildren with special treats, orca grandmothers often feed extra fish to the youngest members of their pod, as well as showing younger orcas where to find fish to eat when pickings are slim. Research has shown that in both humans and whales, having a living grandmother increases chances of offspring survival. But of course, grandmothers aside, the ancestry we humans share with whales is millions of years older than the more recent ancestry we share with the other great apes. We can see some of these similarities in the roles of adult males in the great ape families. The fathers, uncles, cousins and big brothers. Adult male, mountain gorillas, macaques and baboons all form caring relationships with the young of the group, even if these are not their own offspring. Mountain gorilla families are looked after by one dominant older male silverback. His harem of females, often from different gorilla families, occasionally squabble or compete for food. And it's the silverback's job to deal with any trouble that arises. Male mountain gorillas are especially invested in spending time with the babies in their group. These muscled hulks with huge teeth will pick babies up for a cuddle, playfully swinging them around and even snuggle up with them to sleep. These bonds often last for the ape's lifetime. The older males therefore provide a model for the younger primates to learn how to behave and where to find food, 
and also protects them from mishap or predators. The older males benefit too. Studies show that females tend to be more attracted to males who spend time with young apes. Anthropologists used to suggest that the father's role in the human family was mostly provisioning, making sure everyone gets fed, bringing home the bacon, and so on. But times are changing, and a father's role varies with culture, so there is no single model father anymore. But new research has shown that fathers generally help their children to learn language and key social skills, and to form bonds within their community. While there are myriad variations across the animal kingdom, the general definition of a human family is a group of people connected by blood, adoption, or unions like marriage. These are common elements that have been part of human family life for thousands of years. Average family size for hunter-gatherers, both modern and ancient, varied and varies depending on the resources of a place. If there's plenty to eat and lots of space, the area can support more people and families tend to stay together in larger, multi-generational groups. If there's not much food to be had, or other conditions that make life difficult, smaller family groups are likely to strike out on their own to find better lives elsewhere. And so, while we may not be unique as a species with families that include grandmothers and attentive fathers, one thing about human relationships that is different from any other species is the sheer variety of our family relationships. There are families led by men with multiple wives, and families led by women with multiple husbands. There are monogamous pairs of parents and their children, and polyamorous groups where overlapping relationship partners are the norm. There isn't therefore any natural state of the family structure for humans, so there's not really any proto-family origin that we can search for in the past. And so, what do we look for? How can we determine what family looked like for some of our early human ancestors? How does family fossilize? In the East African Rift, the Earth is literally coming apart at the seams. The eastern portion of Africa sits on a tectonic plate, a massive piece of the Earth's crust. That piece of crust, buoyed by the shifting magma beneath, is slowly pulling away from its neighbor, forming a deep valley. And to the north, the plate that lies underneath the Arabian Peninsula is also slowly moving apart. These valleys converge in a Y shape in the Afar region of Ethiopia. The deep lakes, valleys, and steep cliffs stretch for more than 5,000 miles along the eastern horn of Africa. Millions of years ago, this area was lush, forested, and full of lakes and rivers. It was the perfect place for our earliest ancestors to thrive. And so today, it's the perfect place to find their remains. In 1974, Don Johansson, his graduate student Tom Gray, and a field crew of paleoanthropologists were looking for signs of early human evolution at the site of Hadar in Ethiopia. While hiking back to camp after survey work one afternoon, Johansson happened to glance over his shoulder at an unusual shape sticking out of the ground. It was a fossilized bone. Even more excitingly, Johansson recognized the bone as part of the elbow of a primate. A painstaking dig followed, unearthing more and more fragments of what would become one of the most famous skeletons in the world. A female, Australopithecus afarensis, an early human ancestor now affectionately called Lucy. Her skeleton is the most complete Australopith ever found, with about 40% of the bones accounted for. Australopithecus species lived in eastern and southern Africa between 2 and 4 million years ago. The site of Adar has provided hundreds more of their fossilized remains, including more than 200 bones from a group of at least 9 individuals, and at least 4 of these Australopiths were children. This first family, as they were nicknamed, fell victim to a tragedy more than 3 million years ago, an unknown catastrophe that killed the entire group. The whole family was buried in the same layer of fossil sediment, representing a single slice of geologic time. So thanks to geology, we now know that these deaths happened around the same time, but researchers are still arguing over how they happened. 
For a long time, the prevailing theory was that the family had been overtaken by a flash flood, a sudden downpour, far too much water for the dry, packed soil of a desert floodplain to absorb. The deep ravines of the Rift Valley would have channeled the wash of water, sending it roaring through the floodplain, carrying tons of debris and sediment with it. When the remains of the first family were found, there was little evidence that any local predators had damaged the bones. It was agreed that whatever happened, the bodies were probably buried quickly, out of the reach of scavengers. But more research changed the story. The remains of the first family were in bits and pieces. None of these skeletons were as well preserved as Lucy's had been. Indeed, even the number of family members varies depending on which scientist you talk to, though it's generally agreed that this was a group of between 9 and 17 individuals. A geological study also showed that while the bones were probably covered by sediments in a flood, there was no evidence for a violent drowning. The Australopith's resting place was a shallow depression, only about a foot and a half deep, and examination of the sediment showed that it had been deposited relatively gently. Back to square one for the mysterious deaths of the first family. Another theory points to a carnivore behavior known as surplus killing. In these cases, predators kill far more prey than they can eat at one time. Wolves, brown bears, and spotted hyenas have all been observed doing this by ecologists. The Hadar family might have been the unfortunate victims of similar behavior by a saber-toothed cat or other predator. Their bodies may have been covered by flooding soon after. And so research into the fate of the first family is ongoing, and there's currently no definitive answer to the mystery of their deaths. But the first family are an outlier. In general, as we look further and further back into the past, the evidence we can use to piece together the picture of family life becomes more and more scarce. Indeed, before 5,000 years ago, there are no written records to tell us about families because written language hadn't yet been invented. DNA evidence is only helpful if the DNA itself is preserved. Once a living thing's remains are fossilized, all organic material replaced by minerals, there's no DNA to be had. But the first family does show us that at least three million years ago, our ancestors stayed with their close relatives. We can't be sure of the exact relationships of the first family to one another, but it's not a wild assumption to suppose that this was a few related adults and their children. So how far back in time can we see the traces of families like ours? Well, we can go well past Australopithecus to our much earlier primate ancestors. One major clue about primate family structure comes from the difference in size and physical traits between males and females in a species. This is called sexual dimorphism. In many primate species, like gorillas and baboons, the males are significantly larger than females, sometimes double or triple the size. Males also have much larger canine teeth than females. These big differences between males and females occur in species where there is a lot of sexual competition. In these primate families, the males are constantly jostling for a high social position in order to secure the right to mate with the females in the group. In primate species where competition is less about sex and more about food and territory, males and females tend to be closer in size. Gibbons, for example, typically form monogamous pairs and raise their offspring in a territory that they protect together. This means that fossilized remains of extinct ape species can tell us what their social structures were like. If scientists find enough specimens, they can compare size differences between males and females. For example, an extinct species of ape, Macalopithecus kerioi, lived around 14 million years ago in what is today Kenya. Fossil evidence shows that males were roughly twice the size of females. But our closer relatives, chimpanzees, give us a better sense of what family structure could have been like around the time of our last shared ancestor. Though this split happened 7 million years ago, so it's likely that some evolutionary changes have happened since then, in modern chimps, males are an average 18 pounds larger than females, much less of a size difference than in gorillas. And Australopithecus skeletons from between 2 and 4 million years ago show that there wasn't much sexual dimorphism in those species either. Males were a bit larger than females, but definitely not double or triple the size. 
This comparison tells us that Australopithecus families were much more likely to be socially more like chimps than gorillas. They probably lived in small groups and worked together to protect their territory. And what else can we learn about Australopithecus's family life? Well, the roughly 40% of Lucy's skeleton that was preserved tells us a great deal, for we have enough of her pelvis to know that she gave birth at least once. Most primates can give birth unassisted, thanks to their straight birth canals and the small size of infant primates' skulls. But walking on two legs rather than four has changed the shape of the human birth canal so that it twists, forcing the newborn to rotate twice before emerging. Increased brain size and the width and stiffness of the shoulders throw yet more complications into the mix. All of these traits of the human birth canal were beginning to evolve in our Australopith ancestors, meaning that Lucy and other females of her species may not have always had an easy time giving birth. Assistance from other females therefore may have been hugely important to the survival of infant and mother, and that requires a close social structure where older and more experienced females remain with the family group. So it's very possible that Australopithecus afarensis groups were made up of extended families. Mothers, sisters, grandmothers, and so on. Lucy's bones show us parts of her life story that reach beyond simple anatomy. And there's more. Three and a half million years ago, shortly after a volcanic eruption, two Australopiths walked side by side through a plain of ash in what is today Laetoli in Tanzania. And there must have been another eruption shortly after they passed through, because the second coat of volcanic ash covered and preserved the Australopithecus's footprints for millions of years. The tracks were discovered in the late 1970s. One set of prints is larger than the other, suggesting that an adult was walking next to someone smaller, an adult female or a child. Some researchers even claim that the smaller set of footprints indicate a burden carried on one side, a baby carried on the hip, perhaps. It might well have been a small family unit mother, father, and child that left their mark on that volcanic plain. And so, it seems likely that at least three million years ago, our ancestors grouped themselves into families that look fairly similar to the ones we know today. The fact that human families have such deep roots shows that family probably provided some sort of evolutionary advantage. So what was that advantage. The next place to look for answers is in our genes. Charles Darwin was invited on board the HMS Beagle by her captain, Robert Fitzroy. He was to be the geologist on the Beagle's exploratory voyage to Patagonia and a companion for the commander. It would have been unseemly for Robert Fitzroy to mingle with the sailors on board, but Darwin's genteel social status and his keen interest in natural history appealed to Fitzroy, even if the shape of Darwin's nose did not. Darwin wrote in later years that he'd nearly been passed over as the ship's geologist and naturalist, as Fitzroy subscribed to a bizarre theory popular in the 1800s that a person's appearance reflects their character. He saw Darwin's rounded nose as far inferior to a more angular, noble nose. Despite this flaw, Darwin joined the Beagle's expedition, starting what would become a career in scientific exploration that would change how we understand life on Earth forever. His On the Origin of Species was one of the first works that suggested that species change over time through a process of gradual adaptation and he also noted that the way that animals behaved seemed to be as important to survival as their physical traits. In his writings though, Darwin found it difficult to account for some animal behaviours. One of the things that puzzled him the most was altruism. This is when individual animals do things that are bad for them, but good for the group. For example, vampire bats have to feed every 70 hours or so, or risk starvation. And yet despite the necessity of the blood that they consume, bats who have successfully fed might regurgitate a bit of that precious food for other bats who weren't so lucky. And so why would animals do this 
if it's at a cost to them. People often misunderstand the concept of the survival of the fittest. When Charles Darwin described his principles of natural selection and fitness, he wasn't referring to advantages of the biggest and strongest. Instead, he meant that the evolutionary advantage went to the individuals in a species who were best suited to their environment. The best fit. But what is evolutionary advantage? Well, it's simply the ability to pass along DNA. It sounds a bit bleak, but in evolutionary terms, if an organism successfully produces offspring, then it has met its biological goal and added another copy of its unique genetic code to the overall gene pool of the species. Within species, over time, as changes in the environment create different conditions, individuals who have traits that are the best fit for the changed environment are the most likely to survive long enough to pass along their genetic material. Many species maximize the chances of their offspring's survival by having hundreds, thousands or even millions of young at a time. Think fish or insects laying clumps of eggs. Even if most of these young get gobbled up by predators, some will probably survive. But of course humans can't have hundreds of babies in a single birth. What's more, our infants need an all-consuming amount of time and attention for the first few years of their lives. We therefore evolved to have close-knit families as a way of ensuring that our few young ones have the best possible chances of survival. This means that humans, like most other primates, live in groups that look out for one another. Sometimes this is as simple as sharing food when there isn't much to be had, but other times it's more dangerous. For vervet monkeys in East Africa, group members put themselves at risk to watch out for hawks, snakes, leopards, and other predators. If a sentry sees one of these predators, he alerts the group with a shrieking alarm call. His family members get a chance to get away to safety, but the sentry has given away his hiding place, putting himself at risk. These alarm calls and other examples of altruism are a big piece of the human family puzzle. We've evolved to be altruistic towards our family members, but why? What advantage could there be to such high-risk behavior? Let's imagine a sample human. We'll call him Bob. Bob has a mother, a father, and two sisters. Like his sisters, Bob's genes are made up of a unique mix of 50% of his father's DNA and 50% of his mother's. Because Bob's sisters have the same parents as he does, he shares roughly 50% of the same DNA with each of them. And so even if Bob doesn't have any children, if his sisters have children, they will share about 25% of their DNA with their uncle Bob. And now let's transport Bob and his family back in time. Say, about 4 million years. Bob and his family are Australopiths, living in Eastern Africa. If the family's survival depended on avoiding predators and having enough resources, there would be a big advantage in staying in a group to help one another. And in evolutionary terms, even if Bob does not have children of his own, by helping to protect, provide for, and care for his relatives' children, Bob is still ensuring that a portion of his DNA, that 25% that he shares with his sister's children, is passed along to the next generation. Of course, Charles Darwin wasn't aware of the role of genetic material in the passing of traits from one generation of species to the next. He did understand, though, that behavior was part of natural selection, and that included things that seemed to hurt the individuals but help the group. But even with a couple of centuries' worth of evolutionary research, our current understanding of genetics still can't fully explain why humans need families, because the other pieces to the puzzle are far more difficult to study. Emotions Emotions are separate from instinct. All vertebrates, animals with a spinal cord and a backbone to protect it, have fight-or-flight instincts. These are responses to threats baked into our brains from long, long ago in evolutionary time. 
but all mammals seem to share seven major emotional circuits, each with a different and unique pathway through the brain. Each emotional circuit uses different brain chemicals to create different responses to things in their environment. If you were watching a horror movie and the monster suddenly jumped at you from a dark corner of the screen, a tiny electrical charge would pass through your amygdala, hypothalamus and brainstem, and out through your spinal cord. This would cause your body to do all the things that get you ready to survive that monster attack. Your adrenaline spikes, your heart rate jumps, your breathing gets faster and you might scream. Or even wet yourself. Fear is an emotion entirely based on surviving direct threats. But what about the kind of emotional bonds that allowed the development of human culture, technology and society? Any of the things that makes humans so unique. These things are made possible because we can learn and transmit huge volumes of information through social learning. As babies, we learn how to do things from the people around us. We also learn how to understand and react to social situations and how to act in the communities we are raised in. For a baby to have the time to absorb all of this vital information, they need a barrier between themselves and the dangers of the outside world. And that barrier is family. Human families mean that babies can bond and therefore form social ties and cooperate with multiple caregivers. This ability to bond continues even after children become independent. And this is a literal chemical bond between people, reinforced in the brain by a flood of oxytocin. Sometimes nicknamed the love hormone, oxytocin creates positive feelings in the brain, like trust and a sense of safety around those we feel a close bond with. The chemical is released when we are with those we feel close to, especially if we are touching them. Hugs and other physical gestures of affection feel good because they're actually giving us a very mild chemical high. And so, do we see evidence for bonds between infants and caretakers in our fossil family tree? To explore this, we can start with another look back at the differences in anatomy between us and our Australopithecus ancestors, like Lucy. Australopiths had short lifespans compared to ours. Adults rarely lived past 35. They also spent a much shorter part of their lives as children, developing much faster mentally and physically than human children do. Australopith females also had wider birth canals, and overall the species had brains and skulls similar to a chimp's in size, about one-third the size of the human brain. Thanks to that smaller size and the relatively wide hips of female Australopiths, infant brains could be nearly completely developed by the time they were born. Those infants would need much less time and care before they were ready to fend for themselves than later species of human. But a species called Homo ergaster shows up in the fossil record about a million years later, nearly two million years ago, the first of our ancestors to have a body shape that more or less resembled ours. Their legs were longer than their arms, and the hips and shoulders were adapted for the swinging gait of running. Their brains were similar in size to ours, though a little smaller. There's also very little difference in size between male and females of the species. Over time, humans had evolved larger and larger brains, and it's long been posited that larger brains and the changes in anatomy that came with walking and running on two legs meant that in Homo ergaster and the human species that came later, the pelvis was no longer wide enough for the birth canal to accommodate a full-sized brain and skull, meaning that for the last two million years, human infants have had to be born at a much earlier stage of development than other primates to protect our big brains. But recent studies have challenged this assertion, showing that it could be related to the mother's metabolism reaching its limit before the baby's brain can be fully formed. Investigations continue. Whatever the case, it is unquestionable that modern-day newborn humans are soft and squishy and can't do anything for themselves for a long time. This means that they need to be cared for around the clock until they're old enough to eat and move on their own. It's better for the group if family members other than just the parents spend time and resources caring for infants. Altruism, once again, being a big factor. 
All of this care sharing provides a safe environment for taking in all the information we need to absorb as infants, as our brains are still getting their wiring sorted out well after we're out of the womb, meaning that from the instant we're born, we're developing the ability to bond with and learn from other humans. And so thanks to millions of years of brain and body adaptations, and the social ties that give us the safety to develop our brains through a lengthy childhood, humans are uniquely suited to cooperate with one another. On a small scale, this equals family. But on a much bigger scale, this equals society. When archaeologists find the oldest example of something, it's usually safe to assume that it's not the first instance of that thing. For example, the earliest evidence for the production of cheese from milk dates to around 5000 BCE, based on traces of pottery in what is now Poland and Croatia. Of course, it's very unlikely that the knowledge needed for cheesemaking sprang fully formed from an early farmer's mind 7000 years ago. But conditions for the preservation of organic material have to be absolutely perfect for it to last. And even then, after a certain point, no trace remains. It's reasonable then to think that most of the earliest examples we have for anything are actually a bit further along from their original starting point. And this is as true for human behavior as it is for cheese. The oldest recorded piece of gossip is believed to be a bit of writing on a clay tablet from ancient Mesopotamia, describing an affair between a local government official and a married woman. The tablet is only around 3,500 years old, but of course, gossip is far, far older than that. Across all cultures, all across the world, people get together and dish the dirt about other people. In the modern era, gossip often goes hand in hand with the idea of celebrities and scandals. But it is a truly ancient instinct. We evolved to be intensely interested in the actions of other people because it allowed our ancestors to be socially successful. Hunter-gatherers, and even earlier ancestors, lived in small groups. Small enough for all the members to know one another face to face. Our ancestors needed to cooperate as a group to make sure that everyone got their share. That meant that even with a close-knit group, if resources were scarce, your family members were your main competitors. So it would be a big advantage to a hunter-gatherer to remember which people were good at cooperating and sharing, and who was selfish or a cheater. Understanding these qualities meant adapting to have a lot of social intelligence. Our ancestors needed to be able to understand and process the behavior of the people around them in a way that would let them predict how those people might act in different scenarios. Indeed, sharing information about others is a key part of how we know who we might get along with. And part of that cooperation is knowing something about the person you're cooperating with. In families and other close-knit communities, helping out and doing your share is usually a given. This is because the community has a shared understanding that helping someone means that they'll help you back at some point. Whether or not a person is reliable depends on their reputation in the community. And once communities get larger and larger, it becomes much harder for everyone to know everyone else. In a town of 2,000 people, for example, you'll likely know or know most of the people who live in your area. But in a city of 2 million people, you're much more likely to meet a stranger. If that stranger asks for help, you have no guarantee based on community ties that your help will be returned in kind. And so in these situations, it becomes much more important to have a reputation for being reliable. So it's in your best interest to cooperate with social norms. This is one of the reasons why societies tend to agree that certain actions are morally wrong. Breaking a social norm could be anything from acting inappropriately in public to violating a law. The responses are different in each case, but generally, what everyone in a society has agreed on as bad behavior is discouraged by those responses. In 2016, researchers used a public goods game to test whether gossip or punishment had a bigger influence on people's behavior. In the game, each participant received a packet of money. They could choose to give some, all, or none of that money to a shared pool. 
The experimenters would then double the money in the shared pool and distribute it back evenly to the participants. Whether or not you gave money back to the shared pool, you got some money back. In this scenario, a person could easily be a total freeloader, not giving any money to the group, but taking the group's money in return. But between rounds of the game, some players could punish freeloaders so that they received fines. Other players were given the chance to gossip, tattling to members of the freeloaders' new group. In the end, the experiment showed that gossip led to higher levels of cooperation than punishment did. It seems that humans are hardwired to use our social connections to figure out who's reliable and who's selfish. For as long as written language has existed, we've had evidence that ancient people enjoyed a scoop. The law courts of ancient Athens based their decisions mostly on social reputation instead of hard evidence. More than one Greek citizen had his name inscribed on fragments of pottery called ostraka, a way of casting a public vote for someone's exile. If a citizen's name showed up too many times in the vote, they were banished from Greece. Indeed, we get our word ostracize from these powerful bits of ceramic. But once again, as we look further and further back in time along the timeline of human evolution, evidence for social connection gets harder and harder to find. The oldest evidence we can tease out of the fossil record comes from around 2 million years ago. Scientists have studied animal bones and stone tools from the site of Kanjura in what is today Kenya. The tools are made from different types of stone, some of which come from more than 5 miles away. The animal bones show that this wasn't where people lived long term, it was a hunting site. People came from miles around, bringing their stone tools with them. They also brought the raw stone needed to share and make new tools. The little flakes of stone that remain from their tool making show us that this was a shared site, where small groups of people camped, shared materials, made tools, hunted and butchered the animals on site, probably bringing some of the meat back to their families. Around a million years later, in a cave site called Gesha Benot Yaakov in today's Israel, the remains of fish bones, ashes and fire-heated stones show that early humans gathered together around communal fires. These people shared light, comfort, warmth, food and protection from predators. These are some of the earliest places where we see the physical evidence of the shared moments of kinship that are so central to our lives today. At the site of Dmanisi, a cave in the Republic of Georgia, five skulls were found, belonging to the human ancestor Homo erectus. The skulls are around 1.8 million years old, which by itself is remarkable. However, one of these skulls tells us something truly special. The skull belonged to an adult male, who must have been rather old for Homo erectus or possibly ill, as he was missing all but one of his teeth. But these hadn't simply fallen out after he died. The bone of his jaw had gradually changed shape, refilling the holes where the teeth had been. And this could only have happened if the man was alive, which means that late in his life, he survived with almost no teeth. Homo erectus may have used fire to cook food, softening it and making it easier to eat, but their diet would have still been tough to get through without teeth. And so since the man with no teeth continued to live well after losing them, he must have been cared for by the people he lived with. And they cared for him because he was family. It's been more than 10,000 years since most hunter-gatherers began to congregate more and more regularly in seasonal camps, gradually taking on a less nomadic lifestyle. The adaptive reward for social cooperation was the ability to come together to raise crops, herd animals, build towns, cities, railroads and highways. Anything that most of us might consider part of modern human life owes everything to cooperation. Cities depend on thousands of pieces of infrastructure, like transport and sewer systems, roads, pavement, and would utterly collapse without them. The less densely populated parts of the world are no less dependent on cooperation. Food has to be produced and distributed, buildings need to be constructed, sanitation needs to be reckoned with. Indeed, in the archaeological record, we can see how people started to deal with these issues as they began coming together and living more sedentary lives. Different strategies popped up throughout time in different cultures, but all of these societies only functioned because of some form of organization and cooperation. 
we can see that the majority of human interactions tend to be mutually beneficial. Millions of years of evolution has resulted in cooperation being a favorable trait, the best fit to our environment. Humans would never have been able to develop agriculture, build settlements or cities or monuments or even form societies without the complex, overlapping spheres of interaction that build outwards from family. And so, why do we need families? The answer is, they help us survive. We're a species that depends on social bonds and cooperation. Humans need other humans, whether or not they're related by blood. The earliest roots of family stretch back to at least 2 million years ago. Even earlier than that, we see evidence from our primate relatives that shows how the benefits of cooperation and communication likely evolved through millennia of adaptations to challenging environmental conditions. Over millions of years, humans evolved the large brains that allowed us to store and share large amounts of vital information, like how to create technology, navigate a landscape, and adapt better in a shifting environment. Early Homo sapiens, and our extinct relatives like Neanderthals, were fully capable of some surprisingly modern-seeming parts of society, like art, self-adornment, and shared belief systems. None of that would have been possible without the complexity of information that we can store in our heads and share with each other. But of course, those big human brains are costly, especially since millions of years of walking on two legs has shifted the human birth canal. If we remained in the womb until our brains and skulls were fully grown, babies' heads would never safely fit through the opening of the birth canal, and the amount of energy the mother would need to contribute to growing its brain would surpass what she is able to give. A lot of the growth in our bodies and brains has to happen after birth. And so while infants are busy building their brains, soaking up information about the world around them, they are completely vulnerable. Our powerful brains are the reason that we have reached every incredible achievement of our species, and they are also the reason why we need the connections to the important people in our lives. No matter how our families are built, we wouldn't be human without them. You've been watching the entire history of humankind. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a comment to tell us what you think. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.